coming of Jesus Christ draws near. And we pray tonight that you will grant a revelation, Father, of the coming of Jesus Christ and all that takes place. Father, we need you. We need you to teach us. We need you to enlighten us in all these matters. And we pray, Father, that the spirit of wisdom and revelation will rest upon each one of our hearts and minds. We thank you for the angels of God that surround this place. Thank you for the blood of Jesus by which we stand in you. And Father, we will give you all the worship, all the honor, and all our love and all our heart's adoration unto you. Glorify your Son Jesus in our midst today. Open your word unto us in such a manner that it will cause us to be filled with greater zeal, be filled with greater joy as we look forward to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You will notice on page one of your notes, tonight is the last and final lesson, page one of your notes, and we, we have broken down the second coming of Christ in a, into patterns, uh, into various parts so that you can understand the second coming and look forward to Christ's second coming. This is our last lesson on foundational truth. This coming Sunday, you all will have to re-register for another different course. Those of you who have missed even one lesson, you are not entitled to your certificate. But you can make up for it by hearing the cassette tape or videotape, writing a note or a summary of the lesson and handing to me for the lesson to me. They will be marked and graded. The passing mark is 17. And so, when it's done well, then uh, we will consider that as a replacement for the lessons you miss, and then a certificate will be awarded. So next Wednesday onward, we will be having a new series, and we are touching on the panorama of the Bible. In slightly over one year, we will finish the whole Bible. Uh, don't panic. Uh, we will run through book by book. That means in one whole lesson, we will finish the whole book. And we will start uh, from next Wednesday with the book of Genesis. And uh, the Old Testament will be considered one course and the New Testament a second course. So you all need to register on Sunday uh, for the next course called the Old Testament Panorama means an uh, overview of the whole Old Testament. So today is our last lesson on Foundation Truth, Lesson 14. It's on the second coming of Christ, and he also speaks about the judgment of God. There are two aspects to God's second coming, and there are two aspects of God's judgment, and there are two resurrections that have taken place, in case you did not know that. And we're going to see how in the Word of God it all ties up. Of course, we are only interested in the church age as we began. So point A in your notes in page 1, we have started point A as the beginning of the church age. That some say it started in Jesus' ministry, some say it started in the book of Acts. Well, there's uh, no fuss about that. You don't have to be dogmatic. But the main thing is it started. And we are part of the church age, part of the closing days of the church age. And the church age that we are living in is also known as the time of the Gentiles. In the Old Testament, God dealt mainly with the Jews. It was the dispensation of the Jews. Now, God deals with the Gentiles. After the rapture, God deals again with the Jews to finish up all those promises He made in the Old Covenant that He has not finished. God has to keep every word he has spoken before he closed the whole chapter of this generation and the, the ages that we all know, the ages of mankind. And so, this dispensation called the dispensation of the Gentiles 
is when God begins to deal more with the Gentiles than the Jews. It does not mean that the Jews are excluded, but the covenant is now through the church, which is called the new Israel of God. The church has also been called the new Israel of God. The old Israel, while God will deal with them after the rapture again. Some people have asked, why is it that God chose the Jews? Is it because they were smarter? Is it because God was biased? Now you must understand that God has to start with one nation in order to reveal himself. He, he has to choose a nation and through the nation he prepared the way for the Messiah to come through. The, the, the nation he chose is with the purpose of bringing forth Jesus Christ. And once they bring forth Jesus Christ, they will just finish off whatever he needs to finish with that nation and reveal the glory of uh, his, his new covenant, which is for every nation. And that is for every nation. And so don't worry, that was not Jesus Christ's second coming. And uh, that was not a trumpet sounding yet. We are still all here. And uh, so, we see here, that uh, God has to choose a nation. So from the Old Testament, from the time of Abraham right up to the time of Jesus Christ, it was called the Jewish dispensation. God was not being biased. He had to choose a nation. Think about it this way. If God has chosen the Russians, people would ask, why did God choose the Russians? If God had chosen uh, the nation of India, people would see us. Why did God choose the Indian? If God has chosen the Chinese, they would see us. You see, the fact is God has to choose and prepare a whole nation and he prepared the nation for about 4,000 years before Jesus could manifest. Could you imagine that? So it's not because the Jews had more grey matter than other races. It's not because the Jews were smarter than other ways. All men are equal. God has made all men with the same blood. Uh, it's not the, we, we all have blood, red blood. And uh, so, the different blood groups, but we all have blood. Life is in the blood. We all, all human races are the same. There's no superior race. So God just selected a nation. It happened to that there was a man called Abraham who was a man of faith at that time. If there had been a man named Ramasami, God may have chosen him if Ramasami at that time had been faithful to God and God started working through him. See, God just chose Abraham and that was the start of the Jewish dispensation and it, and it uh, concluded in Christ with the exception of another seven years which is postponed to after the church age. The time that we live in today is called the Gentile period. You may have noticed that in the book of Acts, it started as a church that is primarily Jew. All of them were Jews. And in fact, the traditional Jewish Christian thought that the church age was mainly for the Jews to complete God's covenant. So it was like a culture shock for them when Cornelius in Acts 10 received the baptism in the Spirit. They, they were surprised that God was working among Gentiles too. So God was showing them that he, after Jesus Christ is to all nations. It's called the time of the Gentiles. That is the time that we live in. And in the time of the Gentiles, the covenant of God is with the church. It's important for you to know, if you live in the Old Testament and you wanted God's blessings, you would have to go to the nation of Israel. Naaman wanted God's blessings and healing. He had to go to seek a prophet of Israel. And in the Old Testament, God allowed other nations or other, other Gentiles that want His blessing to come under the church of Israel. Is mentioned in the covenant of God. That they are allowed to come in. It's called proselyting, but they are allowed to come in. Certain conditions, they have to be circumcised, etc. But God allowed them in, into that covenant. 
Even David, one of their famous king, was a mixed breed. Remember David's great grandfather, Boaz, was married to Ruth, a Moabite, Moabite, and she is from another race. So it's not so much the blood, the skin color, etc. It's more God's covenant that was made to, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And here in this church age, anything that God deals in this life, in this world, in the Gentile age, God is mainly concerned with the covenant people today, which is the church. You stand in a privileged position. You're God's covenant people today. So from point A to point B, it's called the church age or the times of the Gentiles. The book of Acts began with more Jews than Gentiles, but the book of Acts ended with more Gentiles than Jews. By Acts 28, most of the Christians at that time were Gentiles. All the churches Paul has, Paul has founded, all the Gentile churches. And in fact, the last statement Paul made in the book of Acts 28 was about the Jews. How that they are blinded to see the gospel, but the Gentiles' eyes are open to see the gospel. The book of Acts shows to us the transition from a Jewish dispensation to a Gentile dispensation, which we live in today. So there are a few words that we want to take note, a few phrases in the book of, uh, in uh, your Bible here, in Luke chapter 21, verse 24. Luke 21, verse 24. To under understand prophecy, you have to get familiar with these phrases. Luke 21, verse 24. It states here, And they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive unto all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Notice the word times of the Gentiles. Acts, uh, Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11 and uh, verse 25. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. We call it a mystery. Lest you should be wise in your own opinion, the hardening in part has happened to Israel. Uh, Paul is pointing to a phenomenon that was happening in his time. See, he lived in a transition period and Paul was saying, something is happening in Israel. They seem to be hardened to the gospel. But the opposite is happening among the Gentiles. It says, until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. So God is dealing with this dispensation called the church age, which is also called the dispensation of the Gentiles, the times of the Gentiles. And God's covenant people among the Gentiles is the church of the living Christ. And all of us are looking forward to the coming of Jesus Christ at point B in page 1 of your notes. Point B speaks of a rapture that is coming forth. Many people don't believe in the rapture because they say the word is not found in the Bible. You don't need to find the word rapture before you believe the doctrine about the rapture. See, the word rapture describes a catching away of the church in the air to Christ. So instead of giving a long phrase for that doctrine, we shorten it to the rapture. After all, that's what language is for. So the rapture is mentioned in First Thessalonians, First Thessalonians, chapter five, verse seventeen. First Thessalonians, chapter five, verse seventeen. Did I say verse seventeen? 
Some spring here somewhere. Piping here somewhere. Ah, chapter 4. There we are. Chapter 4, verse 16 and 17. 15, 16 and 17. Let's read from verse 15 in chapter 4. Please amend the error. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the cloud to meet the Lord in the air. Notice in verse 17, we will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. This is called the rapture. The rapture is the second coming of Christ but it's qualified as the second coming of Christ in the air. For those of you who are new to the doctrine of Christ's second coming, let us be, make it very clear that in the second coming, people say, oh Christ is coming, second coming, second coming. What they don't realize is there are two parts to the second coming. Two parts to the second coming. The first part of the second coming is a second coming in the air. The second part of the second coming is when he literally comes and lands on the Mount of Olives. As a young Christian, I, I, they never told me this. I didn't understand the second coming. So when we saw the second coming, I, I sometimes get confused reading the scriptures. So some scriptures talk about Christ doing something down here. And some Christians talk about how, you know, we are up there in the air. And uh, so I got confused. I did not see clearly that in the second coming there are two parts. Actually, the rapture would be called the second coming of Christ in the air. It has not come down yet. It comes in the air. And we rise up to meet Him in the air. And when we rise up to meet him in the air, the, the earth will go through the tribulation period. Seven years. And then that seven years is back to the Jewish dispensation. And then that seven years, early time down here, up there we will be having the Lord's Supper, the marriage lamb of the Lord. So, we will need uh, help, right? So, let me get some of these boys. Kenny, can you come? And uh, uh, Brother Leslie, can you come? She let me. Okay. So, let's say, this is point A. This is where the church is started. Here he comes. Praise God. The Holy Ghost say to perm your hair. <laughs> And uh, so, here is point B, and uh, so point B, he comes up, he comes up here, comes up to the rapture, okay? He comes up and is rapture, that is uh, point B. So the church has gone up there, point B. And uh, having a point B, then we have, yes, praise God. So that is point, point B, that is up there where you have the many support the lamb, that's why Philip is getting ready for that, it has to set up. And uh, so, then from point B, we come right here uh, to point C. Okay? So point C is here. Now we are right now at point C. We have moved from, we are now living somewhere here, between point A and quite close to point B. When this point B, we are all right here up, we will be up here. 
in the cloud. The earth will be down there. Down the earth, meanwhile down the earth here, there will be a lot of uh, uh, tribulation as they are covered in the book of Revelation. Those of you who have not gone to the book of Revelation, is in the tape library. And they are talking about how uh, all those woes and all those things take place down here in the book of Revelation. And uh, several times the signs of darkened and the earthquake happening is judgment pouring down all the, of the uh, bowls of judgment upon the earth during those short seven years. And so while the earth is going through all this tribulation, up there in heaven, uh, in, a, in heaven, we will be having the marriage supper of the Lamb. Where Jesus Christ said, I, I will drink this cup with you again in that day when the kingdom of God is come. So that is the time when we will drink uh, the marriage supper of the Lamb. And it is in that time that the believer will be judged. See, there are two judgments. One is the believer's judgment, the other is the unbeliever's judgment called the white throne judgment. So it's up here that the great, uh, the judgment seat of Christ takes place. All believers will be judged. Everyone who has been in Christ, who has known Christ, from the time of the early church up to the time of the last church, will be judged. We will all be judged up here while the judgment is taking place in the world. Do you see that here now? See, the earth is being judged because of its wickedness. Remember, God owned this earth. Man is accountable to this earth. So all those things and judgment that this earth deserves will come after point B. The church goes up and the whole world goes through. Tremendous judgment. The, in the book of Revelation, the bowls of judgment are poured upon the earth. All the angels pouring it down and crying, whoa, 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 etc. All those things begin to take place. But God did not leave the earth without a chance. It is when point B has taken place, then the two witnesses on this earth will be manifested. The two witnesses are in Revelation chapter 11. Remember the two witnesses. One of them we know definitely is Elijah. The other in the book of Revelation we have studied and we have concluded is more probably Enoch than Moses. Because the two witnesses have to die and after three days they will be raised up again. And it will contradict God's written word in Moses has to die and again a second time. Because Hebrews 9.27 says it's appointed for men to die once. And the only other man who has not died is Enoch. And so that is where uh, Enoch and Elijah, as we believe, is down here and they will be witnessing to the Jews, turning the Jews back to God. So God did not leave this earth without a chance. Even at that time, although it's a, it's a horrible time to repent. But yet, the mercy of God is so great, He has the two witnesses there. And then I have to mention, it's in the Jewish dispensation. Because today in the 20th century, many of God's ministers think they are the Elijah to come. After reading Malachi, John Alexander Dowie, one of the most powerful ministers on healing at the turn of the century, thought after, after a successful ministry and at the peak of his ministry, he thought he was the Elijah. And from the time he, he accepted himself as that, it was downhill all the way. William Branham, the spearhead of the healing revival. The one who touched Oral Roberts' life. The one who touched Tia Osborne's life. The one who spearhead the whole healing revival of all the men of God today. Here's the one whom God was spearheading. He reached a point where he thought he was Elijah. 
and in the end he died in an accident. And can I hear him in the book, uh, My Diary Secret by Mrs. Gordon Lindsay? She mentioned how Kenna Hagin came to see God and Lindsay and had a prophecy and said God is going to take away the leader of this healing revival. In one year, Ben M died in an accident. He was saved, but he died. Because God called him to be a prophet, not a teacher. He tried to be a teacher. He got people messed up in all kinds of wrong doctrine, like serpent seed, etc. All kinds of wrong doctrine. Doctrine about God being one person, three manifestation, all these kind of, of wrong doctrine. And so people's lives are messed up. And so God allowed him to be shortened. He didn't obey. He went beyond the limitations of the anointing on his life. And why we bring this forth is here, that there will continue to be groups and people who think they're Elijah to come. Even in Taiwan today, there's one Elijah Hong. <laughs> and uh, I don't know what he's honking about. <laughs> but they, he thought that Zion has transferred to Taipei. There are many. These are the prominent ones that I just mentioned. But there are many who get themselves deluded thinking that they are the Elijah to come. But one of the simplest things that I failed to see is this. Elijah was to come under the Jewish dispensation and in all probability, Elijah would have been a Jew because it was a ministry to the Jews again, not a ministry to the church. That simple technical point, yet so many have tried to claim to be Elijah. In a Gentile age, Elijah to the church. It's Elijah and the other witness, two witnesses, to the Jews. They are Jews themselves. So the time has not come for them to be manifested. That is the judgment happening down here and God restoring the Jewish people to the two witnesses. And here we have, up here, the judgment taking place. So in the judgment taking place up here, from point B to point C, the judgment is taking place. And in the believer's judgment, it's called the judgment seat of God, found in Second Corinthians chapter five. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse ten. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Now that statement, the phrase called the judgment seat of Christ has a reference to the judgment of the believer. While the world is being judged down there, up here, after the marriage supper of the Lamb, is judgment time. But don't be frightened of Jesus' judgment. Jesus' judgment in the judgment seat up there is not a judgment to hell or to heaven. It's a judgment for reward. See, Paul qualified that. Paul qualified that that we will be judged that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done whether good or bad and in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 he went into a greater detail of the judgment 1 Corinthians chapter 3 Paul speaks here in uh, verse 12 now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will declare it. Capital D, the day. The day refers to the judgment seat of Christ. Where all believers will be judged. That is an a awesome and awesome thought. A, a God-fearing, inspiring thought. A thought that inspired the fear of God in our lives. Remember, we are accountable for this life. Whether you live in the perfect will of God, whether you have done the things that God has asked you to do, we will be judged. Fear some thought, but we need to be steep to the second coming of Christ and what to expect. And here he continues on the judgment. He says, For the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire one's work or what sort it is. 
That means if today you can be doing religious works, Christian, Christian religious works, but it's not what the Spirit wanted, it's in the flesh, it won't survive. The whole thing will get burned up. See, it's more important to do what the Holy Spirit wants us to do, whether He wants you to go to a tiny village and, and witness to ten people. Then, you try to go to ten nations when He didn't ask you to do. God is going to judge you, you notice, according to your work. And He said, if anyone's work, in verse 14, if anyone's work which he has built on it and yours, he will receive a reward. Now the judgment is so that God can reward you. It says, wood, hay, stay, all these are combustible. They will burn off. The judgment of believers is a judgment on the quality of your work, not the quantity. Gold, silver, precious stone. It speaks about quality. Fire cannot destroy it. It only purifies. But wood, hay, stubble, you put fire on it, it's finished. So in the judgment seat of Christ, it's important for us to remember it's not the quantity. It's not running around, winning, you know, trying, trying to do 10 million things. But it's more important the quality, what you're doing and what Jesus wants you to do. That you're doing the perfect will of God. If God did not want you to run around on ten nations and He just wants you to go to a, a village somewhere and that nobody heard about and you did it, your reward will be greater than one whom God never asked to do all those things but run all over the place. See, today, in the kingdom of God, and in Christianity today, we have what we call famous Christians. We may be surprised at the judgment seat of Christ that a lot of uh, Christians who were not known, whose name may never have been known beyond the borders of their village, may be receiving the best reward. God doesn't just judge you on the amount of work. He judges you on the quality of your work. It must be in the spirit. It must be born of love. It, of course, if it's in the spirit, it will be born of love. And it must not be in the flesh. That is why I would say again and again, we must learn to obey the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit tells you to do something, we must learn to do. But on the opposite side, if the Holy Spirit did not tell us to do anything, it is also a skill not to do it. Because human nature, being what it is, will try to do something. It takes skill to wait on, the, on God to find the quality work that He wants you and I to do. Not run all over the place. See, man's thinking and man's judgment is different from God's judgment. So here up there, all the believers will be judged and rewarded. Why do we call this a believer's judgment? You look very carefully at the next few verses. It says, in verse 15, 14 and 15, If anyone work, anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Do you notice he will be saved? So the judgment seat of Christ and the judgment of believers is not a judgment whether you be saved or lost. You are saved because you believe in Jesus. You are not saved or lost based on the balance, which is the normal worldly religious mind. They think that God has a balance. That you put all your good works on one side, all the bad works on the other side, and see which balance, the where the scale go, and if it tilts towards the uh, the good side, you get in. You think through the bad side, bye-bye. But no one says bye-bye. That is not the judgment of believers. The judgment of believers is to reward. I like that. Do you know God appreciates every sacrifice you make in this life? God appreciates 
what you give up in this life to do His will. We can see how much He showed His appreciation of the works of Jesus. Jesus gave up everything to do the will of the Father. You know what the Father did? The Father exalted Him right up. God appreciates. Although while you're on this life, nobody seems to appreciate what you do for God. Although in this life, nobody seems to notice sometimes some of the sacrifices you pay to do the will of God. While others, you know, don't seem to care. But you are someone who cares and thinks about the will of God. Who cares only to please the Father. Nobody may notice you, but God notices. God notices everything you sacrifice. God noticed the times when He called you to do something, it cost you your sleep and you give it up. The time when He called you to give and it cost you, it is a sacrifice to give and you obey. God noticed all this and He appreciates them. And the day of the judgment seat of Christ is the day when God says, Thank you for what you have done to do my will. And God says, Thank you. And He says, I bless you with this for your work for me. Faith day is coming someday. And one day we all be paid by Jesus Christ. I mean, in this life, we reap, are reaping what we sow. To a certain extent, we get paid by God. But there's a real payday someday. It's coming for when Jesus the judgment seat of God will say, Thank you for doing my will. Thank you for all those things that you have given up that I have told you. You could get, live a good life, but you became a missionary. You could have eat, drink and be merry, but you have obeyed me to do this. The judgment seat of Christ is a time that all of us should look forward to. If you have sacrificed for God and worship Him with a sacrificial life, that day is the day you look forward to. But if you have been complacent, you know the Bible says, you go up there, everything... <laughs> you stand naked before God, you see? It's alright. You are safe. Boo! Never sacrifice anything for God. Never done God's will. But believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is my Savior. Ticket to heaven. Oh yes, I got a ticket to heaven. Since you got a ticket to heaven, you better find out what happens in heaven after you reach there. I mean, none of you buy a ticket to another place without finding out why it's over there. Even today when people travel on airplane, before they buy or purchase a ticket, let's say to Timbuktu, I'm sure they're going to find out what's over there in Timbuktu and what to expect. And here believers say, Hallelujah, I'm saved now. Now I can just live a nominal Christian life. As long as I don't reject Jesus Christ, as long as uh, no, no, I just, just go to church regularly, I'll be alright after I've got my ticket. Wait. When the supersonic flight takes place at the rapture and uh, brings you right up to the judgment seat of Christ, and there you are. Surprise! God said, and you go, Huh? Your ticket only got you there. And according to some of those who have gone to heaven, is it? Next thing is tuition class in heaven. <laughs> I mean, we all want to be rewarded, right? Do you, how many of you want to be rewarded? Praise God. It means that in this life, you do some sacrificial things just to obey God. It will cost. It will cost time. It will cost finances. It will cost our, our, a lot of our comfort to do the will of God. But every bit of it is going to be rewarded one day. So that is from point B to point C. 
And when all those things have taken place, all the reward, all that has taken place, now comes Jesus Christ is with us. He has prepared all His army now. We are part of His army and is ready now to descend down. It's not ready. You see, it's judgment time all the time. Once Christ comes, everything is judgment. Judgment down there on the earth and judgment uh, up here, believers. And then it's going to come down for the most final judgment. Everything is judgment once Jesus comes. And that point C to point D. And that is when he can come down now. To point D is when Jesus comes down and we will be with him. See the difference? We were becoming with his sins. Look at Jude. It harmonizes all the scriptures on the second coming. If you have this understanding of how the second coming takes place and all that goes on, it will harmonize everything you have ever read in the Bible on the second coming. You will know which slot to place into when you read scriptures on the second coming. In Jude, Jude, which is the epistle just before Revelation, Enoch in verse 14, the seven from Adam, so that we realize the same Enoch is going to come again, prophesy about this man also saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints. Now notice that. If the Lord comes with his saints, whereas here the Lord came for his sins. And here, the Lord comes to the earth. And here, the Lord comes in the air. This coming here is what is normally called the secret coming. Where Jesus say, a thief in the night. You remember the expression? Now, this coming here is not a thief in the night. This coming here is what Jesus told in the Gospels. He said, And when the Son of Man comes, lightning shall flash from the east, from the west. All shall know that He is come. The rapture is secret, but this is no secret. When Jesus comes and lands on this earth, Therefore, the next time when you read the Gospels, you have to understand that some of the second coming he refers to, refers to this. Some refer to that. You slot it carefully into the right compartments, it will give you a clear overview of the second coming of Christ and the judgment seat of God. Now here in this, this second coming to the earth, you say, then why don't people call it the third coming? They cannot because actually it's still the second coming. It's the second time he came to this planet Earth. You see how to call it the second coming. Remember when he left in the ascension, right? Somewhere here, alright? He finished his work and church it started, he ascended. He ascended in Acts chapter 1 from the Mount of Olives. Look at Acts chapter 1 for a moment. Praise God. Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, verse 9. And when he had spoken these things, they said, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus was taken up from you into heaven, was so calm in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. He will come in the same manner. The place where he took off was the Mount of Olives. For your understanding, that was a spiritual airport. La. And so, sometimes you have to be very simple to get it across. And so, here, when he really comes and lands on this earth, lands in the same airport. Mount of Olives. So he reads the scripture. Look at the book of Zechariah. The book of Zechariah. So in the book of Zechariah, in chapter 14, verse 3 and 4, 
Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as He fights in the day of battle. Remember, this second coming that He came down here is when He deals with the Antichrist who has all those nations against Jesus. That is why that verse refers to the Lord coming down fighting. Now definitely this second coming here is different from that second coming. Then coming to receive, there's no talk about fighting. Here, he comes fighting. He's a man of war. So he comes down as a man of war and he says, his landing place, his airport, in verse 4, and in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem in the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Brethren, that word is this coming. The official coming to the planet Earth. There, here, is the secret second coming for us. Over there is the official second coming when he lands and the Mount of Olives splits into two. And we will be with him, Jude. Remember, Enoch 7 from Adam says, he came with his sin. We will be coming behind him. And when he lands here, what will he do? Revelation. Revelation. Send the book. Revelation. The end of Revelation will take place. Revelation chapter 20. The there will be in verse 14 and I saw thrones when he comes down the Antichrist is there with Satan is there with everybody is there with and they are taken and bound for a thousand years in the one thousand year period the Bible is silent here as I mentioned the thousand year period but it says in verse 4, And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Notice thrones, plural. The saints shall reign with him. The saints. You see, the saints have already been judged. Having been judged and positioned, now they come down ready to judge with him. We will be with him. We cannot fully understand what is in this place here. Because the Bible gives us very few clues. All we know is there is such a thing as a thousand years. And there is such a thing as thrones where the saints sit with him. And he says, I saw the souls of those who have been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the words of God who had not worshipped the beast or his image etc etc and they live and reign with Christ and reign with Christ for a thousand years and then at the end of a thousand years comes the great white throne judgment that we have we are not involved that is judging all the living and the dead for the final judgment to eternal death Praise God. Let's give Jesus a clear offering for that. You all can go for your seat. Now we have make it very clear and outline it for you so that when we begin to touch on small, small details along this uh, panorama of the second coming of Christ, we can understand certain truths. So on the second coming of Christ, there is a whole overview. We have finished section one of your notes. And so, section 2 of your notes deals with understanding the resurrection. See, there is a resurrection here that Paul says at the second coming of Christ. When we talk about second coming, we have to touch on the resurrection because people are not clear on that area. 
Paul say in First uh, Corinthians 15, talking about the rapture, First Corinthians 15, he speaks about the second coming towards the end, verse 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. That's the trumpet for the rapture. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. You see, we know it's talking about the same thing. Because earlier, uh, in the other passages on on, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17, it says the dead in Christ shall be raised. First, Paul says the same thing. The dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruption must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. And here's the point where we have to understand that when Paul talks about the resurrection here coming forth, up, he is talking about the dead in Christ and the living. He says, the dead in Christ will be raised. And those alive, their mortal body will be changed in a twinkling of an eye. That is why some people say, I'll wait until Jesus comes, then I'll accept Him. Can you accept Him before you, you bring your eyes? Try in a twinkling of an eye, before you go say, ah. right here, second place, you're left down here. Go and shake hands with the Antichrist. You know, accept Christ, you better accept Him. Don't wait until, you know, I'll wait until the rapture takes place, you know, I, I, I don't accept Christ yet. Uh, I'll wait until the trumpet sound, and then when I hear a trumpet, I say, Oh Lord Jesus, come into my heart, be merciful to me, a sinner. I want to be the last minute passenger. On waiting list, but not confirmed. Brethren, a twinkling of an eye, you don't have time to confirm your seat. Better confirm it now. Just twinkle your eye. You don't have time to pray. When the rapture comes, it's fast. And our bodies are transformed and we rise together to meet Christ in the air. Now, it's at this point that new Christians find it hard to understand. Because they said, if the dead in Christ have to be raised at Christ's rapture, then today when a person dies, where do they go if they believe in Jesus? If they go up, How come they are down here still? To be raised. If they are down here, then what do they do down here? Sleeping? No. We have to understand that here in 1 Corinthians 15, it talks about the resurrection of the body. Body. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23 tells us very clearly, that there is a spirit, soul, and body. The moment a person dies, what we call die in our natural, physical terms, actually is a transition. Where a person's body dies and their spirit and soul goes. If they believe in Jesus, they go to be with Him. If they do not believe in Him, they go to a waiting place called Hades in the center of the earth. Paul says in Philippians chapter 1, let's harmonize all the scriptures together. Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. And uh, Paul speaks about himself. Here he is in prison. And he has a choice to be with Christ, to die and be with Christ, or to remain. Verse 23. For I am hard pressed between the two. You see, he has a choice to die or not to die. Having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. 
But verse 24, nevertheless to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. So he calls dying departure. When a Christian dies, it's not so much he dies, but it's departure. It's saying goodbye temporarily. That is why Christians need have no fear of death. Dying is only saying goodbye temporarily. It's departing. Dying is graduation day. You graduate up there. But the key words that we want to see Paul says here, If I die, I shall be with him. Now Christ is now at the right hand of the Father up in heaven. So Paul says, I am with him. What Paul was saying, if he dies, he will go to heaven. Then what does it mean when you say the dead in Christ shall be raised? Paul's spirit and soul go up to heaven. Today, if a Christian dies before Christ's second coming, their spirit and soul will go to be with God in heaven. Numerous activities going on in heaven now. And when Christ comes in the air, that's when the bodies of Paul, the bodies of those who have died in Christ will be resurrected. That's what I mean, the dead in Christ are raised. New bodies. And we too will have new bodies. And that's when all of us will have new bodies and go to heaven in a new body. This new body that we have and all who die in Christ takes place at the second coming in the air. All the Old Testament saints already have been resurrected with new bodies. It is called the first resurrection. When Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, Matthew chapter 27 tells us that all the graves of the people were opened. And the bodies came out in Matthew 27. Let's look at that. Matthew chapter 27, verse 53 and 50, 52, 53. And the graves were opened. And many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. That is called the the first fruit, the first resurrection. All the Old Testament saints who believe in Him had only the spirit and soul go to heaven. Their bodies are not resurrected yet. That's the difference. Percy Colley, who has taken a trip to heaven by the grace of God, when he went there, he, he saw Paul and he saw all the saints and the apostles. He also saw the Old Testament folks and he said this, he made an observation. He said, it, it can be seen in heaven. Those who have a spiritual body already, those who have not yet. See, but all of them are in heaven with heavenly activity. So there is, in the rapture, a new body given to all the things in the New Testament. The Old Testament is completed. The new is not. The completion of the New Testament is when immortality is given. We all have a new body. Spirit, soul, and body. So the New Testament is not completed yet. Even the Apostle Paul today and all the Apostles are waiting for their body. Just like in the Old Testament they waited see Christ's resurrection and then all were raised bodily, spirit, soul, and body. In the same way, today, they wait. Except now the waiting place is in heaven. The time is coming, the rest of takes place, we all be in heaven. And so in heaven, when we are there, if Christ does not come yet and a person goes home early, they will have spirit and soul. And they have a new body. Some new Christians are afraid. They say, will I be able to recognize myself? 
Will I be able to recognize uh, my friend? Uh, can I recognize uh, all those people that I have known before? Of course you can. Of course you can. We have listed for you in your notes how that the spirit and soul of a person has all the five senses. Person can hear, the person can speak, the person can feel, person can see, the person can taste, touch, see, and all these things plus memory, remembrance, remorse. All these seven aspects are felt by a spirit and soul. When the spirit and soul has died bodily. So in heaven we will be able to recognize each other, but all of us will be perfected in, in God. All of us will be perfected in God. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, talking about the perfection in heaven, he says in verse 12, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. I will know and I can be known. In heaven, we can recognize each other. See, let's illustrate in, in this way. In the Western countries, most of the time, people wear coat, full suits, right? So they wear full suits. Some of the Western teachers who come, they wear full suits. I mean, uh, there they are. And uh, so, when they wear full suits, which we've already started today, it's a very nice. And, uh, and uh, there they are, when you wear a full suit, it's very hard for people to tell whether you're skinny or you're fat, right? And uh, so, you no, know, just everybody wears the full suit. And then, uh, uh, like uh, Benny Hinn, when he was speaking in one of those states, you're wearing a suit. So, and there he goes walking about, you know, it looks the average size. Then he got a bit hot and he took up his coat and put it aside. Then, then he said, hey, he's skinny. According to a picture that Varasin got back, he's no more skinny. Anyway, what happens when Benny took off his coat? Do you know less about him or more about him? More. See, you, when, when, uh, when, when we are in heaven, we will not know less, we will know more. Now all of us are merely wearing, uh, wearing shirts. But supposing that uh, all of us were to go for a retreat, and in the retreat, there we are, some of us go swimming, okay? And so there you are in your swimming suit. For the first time, we discover whether your skin and bone or skin and muscle. So, what happens when you change in a swimming costume? We will know more about you or less about you. We will know whether you are Esau or Jacob. If you understand what I mean. We will know more about you, not less about you. So, when we put off our body and our spirit and soul go to heaven, we will know more about you, not less about you. So here we are, down here, and the people are already say, can I recognize? Of course you can. You will know as you are known. And having touched on that part of resurrection, let's talk about judgment sin. The second coming sin to cover a lot of judgment. The judgment of believers. We have touched a lot of judgment of believers for reward and the judgment on this earth and the white stone judgment after the end of the thousand years. So we have to understand the judgment of God. If you read Hebrews chapter 6, it tells you that one of the foundational truth, the principles of truth, is called eternal judgment. That is what we are covering. In fact, if you notice, in these 14 lessons, you cover more than Hebrews chapter 6. Because we, we have found that more areas are now basic foundations. And so, uh, in eternal judgment, and in understanding the judgment of God, we have to understand that when it comes to judgment, 
It is not the fullest expression of God's nature. I want to change your wrong image about our God and our Father. The fullest expression of our God is mercy and love. I want you to understand his heart. Just as a father may discipline a disobedient child, does it mean that at that time he's disciplining, that that is the best expression of the father? No. But that was a necessity for the father to do for the child's good. There was a re- an action taken by the father for the child's good. It is not so much a revelation of his true character and, ex- and uh, person. So in the same way, the Bible never says that God is judgment. But the Bible does say God is light, God is holy. Because the fullest expression of God is holiness, love, and life. Judgment is a temporary expression of God that is needed to deal with disobedience and lawlessness. So the Bible in the book of Isaiah chapter 28, when it talks about God judging, it used a special Hebrew word called translated strange in Isaiah chapter 28. Isaiah chapter 28 in uh, verse 21. For the Lord will rise up as at Mount Perazim. He will be angry as in the belly of Gibeon that he may do his, his work, his awesome work and bring to pass his act, his unusual act. The word unusual is the Hebrew word that I've given you in your notes that is translated as strange. Like Nadab and Abihu offer strange fire and uh, all the other places where Hebrew words translate strange. But in this place, instead of putting it strange, they put unusual. But in some version, they still put Strange. Now the word strange means something that is that is uh, different, that is alien, that is not a normal part of the best expression of a person. So when the Bible speaks about God being a judge and God's judgment, it speaks of the word of judgment as something that is unusual. That is strange. Because it's not the best expression of who our God is. But today the devil has twisted it so much so that the general world around us thinks that God is the guy, the big man upstairs with a rod who is just waiting to get you. Do you know that came from the devil? It never came from this Bible. God is more willing to forgive than we realize. Even a hard man like Ahab, when he cried, God said, all right, postpone the judgment. See, that is something strange. But he had to do it because he is a lawful God. It's just like you you have a society where the wrongdoers are not punished, the whole society will go have off. If the wrong... The wrong people and the cruel people and the murderers are allowed to keep on doing what they want without any restraint. Society will collapse. So there is a need to bring order. But a society that is just run on restraint is not the best. So in the same way, if we think that life is just a thou shall not, you miss the whole point. Because when God gives the thou shall not, He also gives the blessing. His fullest intention. 
So judgment is required because there is a disobedience. Because there is a need of a judgment and it's called a strange word. Hebrews chapter 12 says, God is the judge. God is judge over all. But I want to show how our God does not put it in quote like to judge like people think he does. But he had to judge because there is a need for judgment. Not because he enjoys judging. Then you will have a wrong impression. It's not because they enjoy that judging. You know, all around you go around, ha, ah, judge this, judge this, judge this, judge that. He does not. It is strange to him. In a happy home with obedient children, discipline is strange. But it is necessary when disobedience comes. Yet, when the discipline comes, we won't say, Oh, that is the best expression of the family. No. The best expression is love, joy, peace. So, God is a judge. And because of His love, His compassion, His mercy, judgment is transferred to Jesus Christ. As I said last week, Jesus earned his place as a judge. He has been a man and is the best judge. The best judge are those who know it very well. Who know the whole game. It's just like when the World Chess Championship go on between uh, Kapov and Kasparov. The only guys who can interpret all those moves will be the grandmasters who know what chess is about. You don't call someone who has just learned how to move to give a commentary on the game. He would not be able to give a good commentary because he has not played that game. So in the same way, Jesus has been and known the game of life, of human life. He has gone through everything. He has been raised up. Is the best judge. So the father transferred judgment to the son. John chapter 5, in John chapter 5, notice in verse 25, Jesus talks about his second coming. So it's in terms of the second coming that judgment is mentioned. And then in verse 26, 27, John 5, For as the father has life in himself, so he has granted the son to have life in himself, and has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the son of man. So see the whole picture. The father does not enjoy judging. He transferred judgment to the son who is in the best position. And do you think Jesus enjoyed judging? He does not. But there's a need. And Jesus transfer judgment again to John chapter 12. Turn with me in your Bible. John chapter 12, verse 48, 47 verse. John chapter 12, 47. And if anyone hears my word and does not believe, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. Again, you see that judgment is more or less a requirement rather than an expression of who God wants to reveal himself to be. And Jesus says in verse 48, He who rejects me and does not receive my word has that which judges me. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. See, the father transferred judgment to the son. 
Judgment is a strange word for God. And the son transfers judgment to the word of God. So you are judged by the word. So the record, judgment is a strange word for God. He does not enjoy and he does not like to judge. But there is a necessity for law and order in the kingdom of God. So we are judged by the word of God. What does the word of God cover? The word of God covers all of the revealed will of God that man has received. You will be judged according to the light you have received. Nobody can say it's unfair. In heaven, you don't need lawyers to interpret between the lines or the purposes of the laws that are written, like human laws. Human laws, when they are written, can be interpreted in so many ways. That's why you need lawyers to interpret here and there and find some clause here and there. But God's word, which is God's law, is perfect, clear, and beyond dispute. So when you are judged, you're judged by the word. And when all the whole world is judged, and all the unbelievers are judged at the right throne judgment, they are judged by the revealed word to them. Did that the world know and have light of Jesus? John chapter 1 says, He is the light that has lighted every man that came into this world. Sardin Sunasin says it this way. There are two Bibles. One is the Bible as the Christian Bible as we know it. The other Bible he says is nature. Nature reveals God. Which is in line with Romans 1. They say all the things that are created were created to reveal the person of God. See, all of us receive different amount of light. So everyone will be judged according to the light they have received. It will be a fair judgment. In the end, it is the deeds of men that condemn themselves, not so much God. So we understand the whole truth about the judgment of God and keep in mind the nature of God. It is not the best expression of His being. In John chapter 3, verse 17, He says, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Oh, I just hope that I have done my best to bring forth, to show forth who our God is like. That he may understand his great love for all men. And in first, Second Peter, in your notes, they put a second, uh, first Peter, but you change that to Second Peter. Second episode of Peter. In chapter 3, verse 9. In your notes, you have to amend that. This is 1 Peter 3, 9, but it's 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Look at what he says about our God. He wants all to know him. He wants all. That's the true nature of God. He is our Father. And every man is like the prodigal son who has not returned to the Father, the Father of all spirits, the Father of life. God is reaching in his love to all. Erase and eradicate the image that the world has of God. Of someone who is eager to judge and just 
waiting to judge and functions that exist merely to judge. No, he doesn't. Judgment is a strange word for him. He is there to help me. He is there to stand by me. He is there to love me. He is God so that we can run to the one who is unlimited and know him and love him. Let's pray. Father God, we praise you and thank you for your Holy Spirit that has guided us and lead us in this lesson. And we pray, Father, that there be an impartation of grace for each one of these who have sat through this lesson, that you impart, O oh God, a measure of grace into their lives through the words that have been spoken. Then going through all these 14 lessons, they would see and understand you better, that they would be rooted and grounded in love, that the eyes of their understanding may be enlightened, may receive light, may be open, that they may see and know the hope of your calling, the, the riches of your inheritance in the saints, and the exceeding greatness of power to them who believe, and grant that they may all be rooted and established in love, that they may comprehend with all things the width, the depth, the height, the breadth, the length of the love of God which passes understanding, that they may all be filled with the fullness of God in their lives. We ask you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all lift up our hands unto God. Stand together with me. And raise our hands unto God in love and adoration. And we prepare to ask God to seal into our hearts and lives that which we have heard in this 14 lesson, and that God will cause a nurturing and a rooting and an establishment to come into our hearts, that we may be established in grace in Jesus' name. Let's give our lives to Him, singing prayerfully that song, Father, I adore you. Lay my life before you. Father, I adore you. Lay my life before you. How I love you. consecrate to be renewed and transformed by the word of God and our spirit as your dwelling place of your spirit to do your will on this planet earth and not our will Father hallowed be your name 
your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is done in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us lead us not into temptation but deliver us from the evil one for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever in Jesus name amen seal into our heart and life a steadfastness to walk with you preserve our spirit souls and bodies blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in Jesus name we ask amen praise God let's all just give Jesus a good clap of praise God praise to thank you Jesus Praise God, that concludes the foundation series. Register again on uh, Sunday for the Old Testament panorama. And next Wednesday is the whole book of Genesis, 50 chapters. Read it before you come, if you can. All right, uh, we just finish the whole chapter next, uh, the whole book next week.